I've always been obsessed with voice and sound and, you, you know, the mechanism that we have that represents ourselves as we walk into the, the on the planet, you know, so I, I always liked it because it was kind of like a dinner party trick, really, that my, my family would always say, oh, Lake, do the, do the voices, do the accents, you know, they don't talk that way, but, you know, <laughs> um, but it was, it was that kind of thing, and I remember there was, like, a family friend who, you know, took me aside and was like, you got a good ear, kid, you know, keep it up. And I was like, all right, I will. I'll take that to heart, weird old man. Um, <laughs> and, and I did. And it was so, it, it just became something that really excited me. And um, I always wanted to be an actor. I knew that. Um, but uh, voice seemed like so, the idea of blind voice seemed so cool. You could be anybody, you know. You weren't judged by what you looked like. You could, um, could be any social niveau, any nationality, any gender. There's a fun fact in the movie. Um, you know how Gustav is constantly talking to his like big old fat Jewish agent dude um, on speakerphone. That's that's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's something I would traditionally not get cast as. Um, so you know that's the freedom of it. So I, I always thought it quite liberating. All right. I know occasionally in films that. Actors wear their own clothes. <laughs> Are those yours? Um, do you like that? Um, <laughs> um, I um, no, uh, they're not my. Well, I'll, I'll say this um, because I have my sticky hands all over this movie in every respect. I mean, sometimes I pick up a curling iron and curl Michaela's hair, or you know, be like, oh, there's too much red. I don't want that T-shirt. That T-shirt can't be here. You know. Um, and so in the same respect, um, uh, uh, all of the characters are at one point wearing something of my own personal owning. <coughs> so yes, I think Carol, Carol definitely has a lot of my clothes. I don't, I don't have overalls, those are not mine. <laughs> um, you know, but I gotta say they were kind of fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm campaigning hard for them to come back. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, you had a great cast in the movie. Obviously, some of them were your colleagues from Children's Hospital. Yeah. Were these friends of yours, or how did you get such a great cast together? The majority of those people are really good friends of mine. They, um, you know, I, I, I cashed in a lot of favorship <laughs> on this movie, um, and and I'm really lucky that a lot of these comedians, you know, had the audacity and the trust in me to come out and kind of play real emotion and. and um, because that's almost scarier, you know, if you're somebody who does sketch or super broad comedy, to come out and, you know, kind of take yourself seriously is scary. And and if the movie sucked, you know, there's nothing they could do about it. It'd still be on their goddamn resume, so um, <laughs> there would be no excuses. So I was really, I was thankful that they took took a chance, you know, on a first timer. Uh, women don't get to make a lot of movies these days, especially young women, and movies with a feminist ending. How did you, how did you get it done? Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I, you know, I, I, I had great luck with this. I, I never felt like uh, anyone was like, listen, kid, you know, you can't do this, or you're a girl, bad, don't make movies. I never felt that way. Um, and I'm very lucky for that because I think in independent filmmaking there are so many great ladies that are doing it, truly. Um, maybe not in the studio system, it's a different thing and I understand that. Um, but in, in, in the independent circuit, you know, especially at Sundance this year, you know, I sat, um, you know, with all the other competition directors and half of them were women. I don't know, you know, they're literally half and half this year. and. Um, and it felt great. And I, you know, I looked to this side and see my friend, you know, my friend Katie Appleton Duplass, who makes movies with her husband Mark Duplass, and then, you know, um, you know, whether it's Britt Marling or Lena Dunham or or um, Lynn Shelton, N Nicole Hall Center. You know, within the independent circuit, there's so many. Julie Delphi. I mean, uh, you know, Miranda July. You know, uh, for me, I feel really supported and and. Um, but I also <laughs> honor the fact that it is somewhat still rare, and certainly in comedy, you know, let's say that. Um, but I felt like I had a good team of people who were supportive, and it, was, it felt, felt nice, you know. So. Oh wait, he really was in line. <laughs> 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 he thought, and then, okay. 
Oh my god, did you forget what you were going to say? I hate that. No. Do you want to come back? No. Um, oh, uh, for the research, for the role of the voiceover, like, uh, how long did you research the voiceover, the whole voiceover career? Like how, how, long, how much went into that? And do you get to meet uh, Don's family at all? Um, so I didn't, I didn't know um, Don LaFontaine at all or nor his family, though they were supportive in this. As they, they're, they, Don LaFontaine's estate owns the three words in a world and in a world where, because uh, he actually penned them. So he he created it. <laughs> um, and it did become, an, it changed movie trailers forever. And uh, he really was a legend. Um, but the, the, the voiceover industry was not something that I directly uh, researched. I tried to be a voiceover artist personally um, and kind of failed. Um, so I really, this is basically a 93 minute audition <laughs> for the industry to see. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so, so it's something that I have always aspired to be a part of. And when I went out on auditions, I remember seeing the lay of the land in those audition rooms. It was really, really specific. And there was a click, like those people did this thing, those people did that thing, and that's it. You know, and there's not a lot of like, hey, we want to help you come and be a part of this. It's like, there's very, there's fewer jobs. Um, it's a rarefied talent, you know, and um, and especially now with um, you know celebrities endorsing products by their voice, like, you know, I think it's become even more protective about what they do. Okay, so there was somebody else in line. Okay. <laughs> Straight shirt. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess my question was kind of to piggyback off that. Like, I've never really seen a film surrounded around the theme of like movie trailers. It's like right. it's like a movie about movie industry. Right. But, like a part that you don't really see. I guess you kind of answered like what inspired you to to um, you know write a movie about. Yeah, people have to pee or go. I have a thick skin. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, so you're like, why movie trailers? Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, honestly, it just came out of an organic conversation that I had with a friend of mine, but, you know, because I'd always be like, in the world, where do you go to the kitchen to get some chicken McNuggets? <laughs> and it was just, in the world, where I have to go to the bathroom, and in the world, you know, so, and then it was sort of like, isn't it, wait a second, isn't it weird how no woman has ever done that, nor, frankly, any, voiceover and in trailers ever? God, what the hell? You know? And then it just became an interesting conversation which led to, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of do a movie about a, a female vocal coach who like sets out to be the first woman to utter the words in a world? And my friend was like, no. <laughs> Literally. And I was like, great, I'm making that movie. <laughs> um, but I was like, obviously it's not just about that. There's also daddy issues. You know? um, so, you know, it, it really just was, it, I, I thought it would be interesting and colorful, and I remember seeing The King's Speech, you know, that incredible movie, and um, being, you know, I was like, I had written in a world already, and I was so inspired, because it was like, there is something inherently auditory, um, you know, that is minute and very um, specified that is now visual, you know, that was, it was, it was really interesting to take something so specific and make it so visually interesting thematically. So. Okay. How long was the process from the time that you came up with this idea and then started writing it to? How long is the process? Um, the door to door, like five years. Um, so writing process is like a year and a half to two years, and then the rest is, is production and so. Yeah, can you tell us a little, little bit about what kinds of things you've done in the past and what your plans are for the future? Um, you know, as an actor, for, I mean, I went to drama school in England and I studied the classics and I acted like a tree and, you know, and all that. And then, um, you know, went out to Hollywood and then they're like, get a push up bra. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so I did all that. And then, uh, you know, I was constantly writing. I'd always been a, a closet writer. and. Um, my mom always really supported that. She wanted me to be a journalist, um, but I, you know, really wanted to be an actor, and I followed that path and have done a myriad of like TV shows and, you know, uh, movie stuff, and then now sort of find myself here. But in future, 
I'm writing my next feature, which is really cool and lonely <laughs> because it's just me and the computer. Um, and then, um, you know, Children's Hospital is a show that I do. Um, and, uh, that's awesome. That's what litmus tests to make sure that you're miserable. Um, so that's in its fifth season. It's on Adult Swim. It's actually airing tonight at midnight. Um, it's an episode that I directed tonight, um, which I'm really proud of, that Nick Offerman stars in. Um, and so I direct uh, some of that now, too. We just got nominated for a second Emmy. Um, and then uh, I just forgot my mom. And that's weird. There's like fart jokes in that. Yeah. <laughs> fart jokes, Emmy. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I just finished uh, rapping. Uh, just as an actor, I did this movie called Million Dollar Arm. Um, for Disney, uh, it's a, like a feel-good baseball movie with John Hamm, Alan Arkin, and Bill Paxton. So that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And that'll come out. You know, that was cool. Just Alan Arkin. <laughs> what was it like to direct a movie that you started? What was it like to direct a movie that I started? Um, not easy. Um, it's really difficult. I mean, what's difficult about the whole process is just the, it's like they're already separately to act in a movie well is difficult and then to direct a movie well is difficult and then to write a movie well is difficult. So when you smush them together, it really becomes athletic. Um, that's the only way I can, I can liken it to like sports, you know, you have to have sneakers on, you know, you have to be sort of like ready for anything and have a focus and an energy at all times and make sure every department is feeling good, is how's defense, okay, what about offense, you know, <laughs> what are our plays here, you know, and it's, it's really like that. Um, directing myself, I never personally have been sort of emotional about looking at myself and going, ew, I sound like that, or I look like that, you know, I, I'm not thinking about it, so I'm very objective, and that's just, I realized is, is unique, because some actors can do that, some actors can't. I just don't, I just look at myself as Carol. I'm like, yeah, that was a good take for Carol. We can move on, you know. <laughs> Which present day director do you aspire to be? Which you aspire to be? Present day is, is almost more difficult than past day. But, because um, I think it's easier to sort of aspire to someone before than current. <laughs> um, it gets too close or something. Um, but I, you know, I'm a fan of, of Scorsese, of all people, and, um, and Paul Mazursky, um, you know, Robert Altman, um, and Woody Allen. I mean, I, I would say it last because it's so obvious that I'm obsessed with him. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, I mean, I should be. I'm from New York, and, you know, I love female characters. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, the apartments were very real, real estate. Were they in fact real? Uh, the apartments were all real except for Danny and Moe's, which was a um, sort of like random loft space that we created that apartment, which I know. I, it really was, but initially I wanted something so much more cramped and, you know, I wanted sort of a heart. I wanted it to be like, like a shabby chic hug. Um, but um, but then but, you know then we sort of found that space and, and it had good space. you know we could kind of create this I, I could do all my camera moves in there it was great it was bigger than I expected but. so obviously it comes out August 16th is it getting a wide release oh. <laughs> <laughs> great <laughs> good is that a wide release or is it uh, no it's a tiered release okay. which is so in New York and LA it goes um, August 9th and then. In, on the 16th, it goes, you know, it comes here, and then a, a couple of other cities, and then the 23rd. You know, it keeps rolling out. It's a rollout situation. What was your development process for the script? Did you take it to Sundance, or did you just work on it yourself? Um, the the script was, um, like I said, uh, about a two-year process, but um, I took it. I, I didn't uh, lab it or anything like that. Um, I just took it to my agents and said, here it is, when it, once it was done. But um, I did lean on my, my, you know, a myriad of my very talented friends that I could say, hey, could you take a look at this? And 
that's always hard when someone's like, hey, can you read my script? <laughs> Especially if you haven't written, you know, if they don't know that you've written other things, you know, it's just like, whoa, God, it's like a, you know, bullet in the head, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so I always am so, I'm like, I'm sorry, you know. But, uh, but so I cash those favorite tips, too, on writers. So. But that's where you learn, I mean, from notes. You know, great notes are, are, are priceless. In a film that actually had me laughing and smiling throughout, the uh, Michaela Watkins monologue um, in the lobby um, really resonated with me. It was a really raw um, piece of emotion. And I wanted that to know where that have. came from. Um, and then also, you have such a great A-list comedy cast. Was there a lot of ad-libbing on the set, apart from your script? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to answer the second question first, which is, where th was there ad-libbing and whatnot? The, the, the surprising thing was I did hire all these just amazing alternative comedians who are tremendous improvisers, and we did very little improvising on, um, on the day, mainly because of time. Same with Children's Hospital. We barely improvised on Children's Hospital. It's like, uh, we just, you know, you can't, improvising is a luxury. You know, oh, let's just find it. Let's see what happens in the day. You know, that's, that's craziness. You know, unless your whole project is like, like, if you're shooting the league or something, that their whole their whole thing. When we do that, that's like all improvised, and it's supposed to be. But when you have a script, you have to get the script in the can because you don't know. Dimitri once said something. He was like, you don't know if what what sort of silly thing we think we're doing now is going to be really helpful or resonant in the edit. You know, it might just be kind of funny today. Um, so when you have to adhere to the economy of a story, you know, it's like I don't want to linger, it's a comedy, you got to get in and out, you know what I'm saying? 